Everybody. All right, we are wrapping up the series that I've been in for the last, uh, the, the course of this month. I kicked it off then, <laughs> excuse me, the last two weeks have been out, but I, my team has done a great job of, of picking up and sharing the rest of uh, the, this series. So if you missed the last three weeks or any of that, go back to our website, weareimpact.com, or download our app, and you can watch those messages right there. But we're wrapping this series up, and it's entitled Surrendered. And this is a quote that I want to give you that's kind of been the basis of this, this series. And it says, to surrender to God is to give up all pushback against his rule, his way, his plan, his process, and his timing. Can I get some honest people in here that are willing to say that's a little easier said than done sometimes? Because if I'm going to really say I'm surrendering to God, that means I got to give up all pushback, which means I'm not questioning him anymore. I'm not arguing with him. I'm not trying to find another way around it. I'm not any longer pushing back against his rule, which means I know he's in charge. I'm not pushing it back against his way, which means it might be different than how I plan to do it. I'm not pushing against his plan because he might have a plan that's not the same as mine. His process or even his timing, because sometimes I have his plan, but I don't have his timing. And I don't know if you figured it out, but sometimes it feels like God's timing is on turtle time. I'm ready for him to do it right now or yesterday. And he's telling me to be patient and wait until I can you know, walk out the fullness of what he has for me. Now, the scripture that we've been using to launch this is 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. <clears throat> I want to read it again. It says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, which means set aside all that self-righteous pride, so that God may exalt you to a place of honor in his service at the appropriate time. Now, today I want to add on to that verse number 7. I, I, I had to wait to the end to add on verse 7 because you can't even do verse 7 until we've done verse 6, which says, humble ourselves under the hand of God. So until I realize that I need God, I got to trust God, he's actually smarter than me. Come on, he's stronger than me. He knows better than me. I have to humble myself before I can do verse 7, which says this, casting all of your cares, all of your anxieties, all of your worries, and all of your concerns, once and for all on him, for he cares about you with deepest affection, and he watches over you very carefully. The Bible teaches us here that we've got to humble ourselves, come down off of our mountain, come down off of our place of pride, so we can recognize that we need to cast all of our cares over unto God. Humbling ourselves and surrendering to God postures us for God's total provision. In other words, when I find myself in a position of humility and I stop thinking that I know what's best for me and I stop trying to outsmart God and, and try to stop trying to manipulate his will to do it my own way, and I finally come to the place where I surrender to him, if I humble myself and I surrender, then I posture myself for his full provision. Can I tell you what that means? That means whatever I have need of in my life, when I've humbled myself and surrendered to him, I have a right to have an expectation. He's going to show up. When I watch this, if I've positioned myself that way, it should place me in a position to rest, which means I, I should no longer be worked up. I should no longer be anxious and, and full of anxiety. I should no longer be all nervous and concerned. How am I going to fix this? How am I going to get that right? Because I know that I've humbled myself before God. I've stopped pushing back against him, and I'm willing to say yes to his will, yes to his timing, yes to his plan, and it puts me in a position where I'm able to rest. Well, now, today is what we traditionally refer to as Palm Sunday. We, we, we said that to you. And today marks the day when Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem on a donkey, and his followers kind of made a red carpet entrance. They took their, their outer co coats off, their outer garment called a cloak. They took their cloaks off. They cut palm branches down. They waved those palm branches in the air saying, Hosanna, save us as he came in. Then they took those palm branches and put them on the ground, took their jackets and put them on the ground, and they made a red carpet entrance for him to ride in Jerusalem. That's why we call it Palm Sunday. And this week should be, this Passion Week should be a reminder to us of God's amazing love for every one of us. When you watch that Good Friday service this upcoming Friday at noon, and as you're watching us recount what happened to him, and, and you hear me talk about just how brutal it was when they crucified him. I want you to be reminded of this fact. He did that just for you. That was a weak amen. I, I want you to be reminded he did that just for you. I mean, if somebody took a bullet for you, you'd have honor for them. 
But for somebody to go to the cross and be tortured the way he was tortured, he did it just for you. I know he did it for the world, but I want to, I want to make it personal this Passion Week. He did it for you. I've said this for years. If you had been the only person on the planet that needed salvation, God would have still sent Jesus just for you. Come on, make it personal this week. That means that if Adam had never sinned and Eve never sinned and if Noah never sinned and Moses never sinned and Abraham never sinned and David never sinned and Elijah never sinned and your great-grandparents never sinned and your uncle never sinned and your mom and dad never sinned and the first person in the recorded history of human nature to ever sin, if it had been you, God wouldn't have stopped and said, oh, well, everybody else has done pretty good. He wouldn't have stopped and said, well, I've got trillions of children already. I, I, I can live without one. He would have still sent Jesus here to go through what he, we're going to remind ourselves that he went through this week. He would have sent him here just for you all by yourself. That tells you how important you are to God. But it will also remind you that no matter how difficult or confusing your life might be at the moment. I don't know what's going on with you. I didn't get to ride home right in with you. So I'm not sure what may be happening at home. But no matter how difficult or confusing life might be at the moment, this week should remind you of this one truth right here. Romans 8, 32, since God did not spare even his own son, but he gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? <laughs> that means that if he didn't keep back the best gift that he had, his son, then you better believe he'll help you pay the rent. Amen. If he didn't hold back the best gift he had in his son, Jesus Christ, you better believe he's got tuition money to help you out with. You better believe he'll, yeah, he'll help you figure out what that next job situation is. Yes, you better believe he will step in to help settle things and bring peace to your marriage or help bring your wayward child back home. Because if he didn't keep back the best gift of all, Jesus Christ, then whatever else we have need of, the answer is absolutely I'll step in to help you with that too. See, if we really believe God's love for us, then it moves us to not only surrender our will to God, but also our pain our problems, and our people. Not only does God want us to surrender our will, we've been talking about that for the last three weeks. He wants us to surrender our will. God's got a way that's different than ours. But not only does he want us to surrender our will, he also wants us to surrender our pain. Anybody got some pain that we need to leave at the altar today? What are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about that thing from your past. I'm talking about that hurt that you've been nurturing. I'm talking about the thing that has altered your whole personality. God wants us to surrender our pain to him. Bring it to the altar and leave it here. Casting all of our care upon him once and for all, which means don't bring it to the altar with a yo-yo string and take it back when you leave. He wants us to surrender our pain, but he also wants us to surrender our problems. Anybody got some problems you need to leave at the altar today? About six of you. The rest of you, everything is great, right? Let me ask again. Anybody got some problems that we need to leave at the altar today? Here's a good one for you. He also said he wants us to leave our people. Anybody got some people in your life you need to drop off right, right here? In that, that little spot right there. Just drop their behind off right here. Come on. Hmm? When we talk, I, I got a list of folks. Just leave their butt right here, right there at the altar. We talk about surrendering. Now, I just talk about surrendering our will. Today, I want to wrap this up with surrendering to God our pain and our problems and our people. I got a verse for you. This verse right here I'm reading is for you. It's Psalm 95, verse number 3. It says, For the Lord is a great God. He's a great king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest of mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. His hand formed the dry land too. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker for he is our God. We are the people he watches over. We are the flock that is under his care. This is the part of the verses for you right here. This is, this is yours. If you can only listen to his voice today. God is everything we read in verses 5. He's the one that watches over us. He's the one that is mightier than the mountains. He's the one that has the whole world in his hands. If we could only get us to listen to his voice today. Everything God wants to do in our lives is tied to this reality. we got to listen to what he's saying. And when God is trying to get us to let go of our pain and our problems and our people, he can ask us to let it go and to hand it over to him, but he won't snatch it and take it away from us, which means we've got to train ourselves to listen to his voice. 
So this verse right here, we find an important key for releasing the stress that comes with our pain, our problems, and our people, and that is this right here. Listening to God must be my first priority. Listening to God must be my first priority. And I feel like I lost about half of my audience right there. Because if I can be honest with you, after 30 years of being in ministry, 28 years of being a senior pastor, let me tell you what we really want to do. We really want to do our own thing and just have it work out. I got six amens and about 25 nods. Yep, yep. That's about right there, Reverend. Yep, yep. Is it? Yeah. Let's, let's be honest. Most times, we don't want to talk to God to find out who should we marry. We want God to bless the one we fell in love with. Hmm? Most times, we don't want to talk to God to ask him, should I take this job? We see how much the job is paying. It's paying more than the one we're on right now. We take it, and then we want to ask God to bless it. Fix all the people in here, God. But what we're saying is that my first priority has got to be listening to God. That means my first priority is not going through my mental file cabinet trying to figure out how to fix all my problems. My first priority cannot be trying to solve everything around me, and then when I get exhausted and wore out, invite God in to try to help me out. I want to read a story to you over in the book of Luke chapter 10. The story of two sisters. One's name is Martha. One's name is Mary. And in Luke 10, verse 38, it says, As Jesus and his disciples went on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat down. Everybody shout, sat down. down. Come on, you didn't shout. Shout, sat down. down. Come on, one more time. Shout, "Sat sat down. She sat down at the feet of the Lord. Watch this. And she just listened to his teaching. I mean, know some people just they don't need more counseling. They need to just sit on down. Sit down. <laughs> anybody, anybody know somebody that they, they don't need no more counseling? You just need to sit down. That's what you need to do. Just sit down. That, that's the word of the Lord for somebody. Just sit your tail down. Just sit on. Sit down. <laughs> she sat down and listened to his teaching. Martha was upset over all the work she had to do. So she came and said, Lord, don't you care? that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself, tell her to come and help me. Then the Lord answered her and said, Martha, Martha. Or he could have said, Sandra, Sandra, for some of you out there. Nicole, Nicole. Bertha, Bertha. Shandrika, Shandrika. Can you imagine God in heaven like, what did they name this baby? <laughs> <laughs> Some of y'all would have messed the Bible all the way up, man. <laughs> and the angel Gabriel said, Shandrika. <laughs> he said, Martha, Martha, you are, watch this, you are worried and troubled over so many things. In other words, Martha, this is not the only thing you're worried about. This is the item today. This what is what's on the top of the list today. But he said, you... Every time I show up, you're always worried about something. He said, you're worried, Martha, about so many things, so many situations, so many different things, but just one thing is needed. Mary has chosen the right thing, which is sitting down listening to God, and it will not be taken away from her. See, Martha... While we look at Martha, it's easy to judge Martha like, well, she got Jesus sitting right there in front of her. Why wouldn't she sit down? She had running around doing everything else. It's easy to see it in Martha's life. It's harder to see it in the mirror. Because if we get honest with ourselves, there's a whole lot of men and women in here that have a Martha spirit on them. If you think about what Martha's going through, Martha has Jesus and his entourage coming to her house. You do realize that Jesus traveled with a posse. It wasn't just Jesus. It's one thing if it's just Jesus coming to your house. He's got 12 other dudes with him. And it might have been more people than that. And they show up at her house, and just like any good host, she wants to make sure everything is right. You know how some of y'all are. I mean, she's scrubbing and cleaning everything. I remember back in 1998, our church was a lot smaller. Honestly, you could have fit our whole church in this middle section right here. And uh, we, we were only two years old at the time. 
and uh, actually not even quite two years old because at the start of 98, April and I decided we're going to visit every family in the church. I think we may have 500 people or so at that time. And so we, we, we announced on a Sunday, if, if you would like a home visit, then all you have to do at the end of service, go to the table in the back. We had slots already lined up. You can fill in what day and time worked for you. We came in the in daytime if you're available, came in the evening if you needed evening time. And we did that from January all the way through the end of the year for every family that wanted to visit. And I can remember, I mean, I, I'm looking out now, see, see families in here that go way back then. Leslie Marshall was here. She, she, she had like Jack Daniels on the, on the thing. And we, had to, we had to tell her, put that away. I made that up. She did that. It, it wasn't Jack Daniels. It was some other liquor. I don't know what. It <laughs> but I remember coming to her and Daryl's uh, house for home. Visit. Actually, right, right, right across the street here off of Monument Road. And they live in an apartment right over here. And that's when I prophesied over Daryl that the Lord's going to have you right on my hip. He's been beside me for almost 25 years now taking care of me. But it, it started right there in their home visit. And I look out here, and there are other people I remember us doing their home visits. There's some of these adults in here that were kids sitting at the table, or some of them in car seats when we did the home visit back then. And the point I'm making is we went to several homes. We had to have visited 150, 200 families that, that year going, going house to house. But one thing I can tell you is there was never a house we went in that was dirty or nasty or in disorder. Why? Well, because the pastor coming. I mean, every house we went in, it smelled like pine, salt, and comet. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and that's just with, with Pastor Davis and Minister April coming to visit. Can you imagine when you hear Jesus coming to my house? So you already know what, what Martha's up doing. She's doing what some of y'all do on Thanksgiving Eve. You can't come to church because you're up there cooking your casserole. Got to make sure everything is just right. She's trying to make sure everything is in its right place. And she's allowed herself to get bogged down with the stress. Let me tell you, she's dealing with stress. She's dealing with worry. She's dealing with micromanagement. She's got a spirit of perfectionism on her. She didn't let herself get agitated. And watch this, she's got misplaced priorities. Now, some of y'all should have said amen because I named about four or five things you're dealing with at the moment. And she's allowed herself now to get frustrated with her sister Mary because Mary's not worked up like she is. She's worked up running around like a chicken with her head cut off, and Mary's sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, listening to, che- listening to church. She's sitting there at the feet of Jesus. All this stuff we need to do, and you sitting here at the feet of Jesus? Let me tell you why. Because stress-filled people always get agitated when they're around stress-free people. Because they don't get worked up enough for them. Hmm? We about to start a fight up in here, up in here. Hmm? Stress-filled people always get agitated when they're around stress-free people. Because they make everything an emergency. And stress-free people have learned that I'm not about to let myself get worked up like that over everything. See, Jesus clarified that Martha's worry wasn't just about the dinner. It was a pattern of behavior for her. When Jesus and his entourage left, she was going to find something else to worry about. Before she even knew they were coming, she was worked up about other stuff. And what Jesus was saying is, you're blaming it today on this, Martha, but this is what you do all the time. You are a world champion warrior. And if we get honest, some of you are world champion warriors. Some of you come from a lineage of world champion warriors. If there was an Olympic game for warriors, your grandmama would have the gold, your mama would have the silver, and you'd be on the podium with the bronze. Y'all just worry. That's what you do. That's what Jesus is saying about Martha. You, you, you blaming it on this, but you worry about all kinds of things. See, when we allow worry to become a pattern of behavior, it can be very dangerous. Hear me out when I say this. Many illnesses that people face are the result of living in a continual state of stress and worry. And I'm having fun with this, but I believe with all my heart, and I'm saying this by the Spirit of God, I believe there's some people sitting in here right now that are on the verge of danger. You don't even know it. Because the enemy doesn't care how he gets you out of here. Understand this. He will fight tooth and nail to keep you from getting saved. 
But the day you get saved, the thing he would love to have next is go ahead and go to heaven. Because if he can't keep you from getting saved, he'd love to have you take your saved self to heaven so he can get you out of the way. And he doesn't care if he does it with drugs and alcohol. He doesn't care if he does it with you hanging out late, being in the wrong place at the wrong time and getting taken out of here. He doesn't care if he does it with you having good intentions, trying to fix everything and everybody in your life to the point to where you wear your heart down and, and release sickness and disease in your body that never should have been there if you simply learn how to put your trust in God. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. I'm preaching better than you are saying amen. I want to read you this from WebMD. It says, how does stress affect our health? Listen to this. The, the human body <coughs> excuse me, is designed to experience stress and react to it. Stress can be positive, keeping us alert and ready to avoid danger. But stress becomes negative when a person faces continual challenges without relief or without relaxation in between those challenges. As a result, the person becomes overworked and stress-related tension builds. Stress that continues without relief can lead to a condition called distress, a negative stress reaction. Distress can disturb the body's internal balance or equilibrium, leading to physical symptoms including headaches, upset stomach, elevated blood pressure, chest pain, and problems sleeping. Research suggests that stress can also bring on <clears throat> or worsen certain symptoms or diseases. Stress also becomes harmful when people use alcohol, tobacco, or drugs to try to relieve their stress. Unfortunately, instead of relieving the stress and returning the body to a relaxed state, these substances tend to keep the body in a stress state and actually cause more problems. Consider the following facts. of all adults suffer adverse health effects from stress. Did you hear what I said? 43%. That means out of 10 people, you look down the road and you count 10 of you, four of you right now are dealing with adverse health effects that come from simply being stressed out. Listen to this. 75 to 90% of all doctor's visits are for stress-related ailments and complaints. 75 to 90 percent of the things we end up going to the doctor for are things that we could probably cure on our own if we simply learn how to bring our lives in balance and stop being stressed about everything. Stress is linked to six of the leading causes of death, heart disease, cancer, lung ailments, accidents, cirrhosis of the liver, and suicide. And the lifetime prevalence of an emotional disorder is more than 50 percent often due to chronic, untreated stress reactions. Today, there's a whole lot of conversations about emotional disorders and mental health, and I don't make light of that, but this is teacher telling me right here that if we learn how to get our stress under control, probably half of what we end up blaming on mental health or emotional disorders could be brought in balance because if we simply learn how to watch us manage what we can manage and let the rest of it go then what this is teaching me is we wouldn't have so many people needing to pop a pill or Xanax to calm themselves down. Wouldn't have so many people needing to be prescribed something to help us settle ourselves down. God created us to be able to settle down. But he created us to be able to settle down, not by handling it all on our own, but by learning how to cast the care on him. Give it to him and actually give him space to work it out. See, there are certain things we do have control over. We, 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 we have control over certain things. Things we can control, we should control. If I'm trying to lose weight, I, I can control parts of it. I can't control my thyroid. I can't control my genetics. I can control how much food I eat. I can control that 3 a.m. chocolate cake desire that comes on me. Hmm. I can control pushing back from the table a little bit. Because that's because I like it doesn't mean I should eat it. I can control getting up and moving this body a little bit more, whether it's walking or running or getting more active instead of sitting around wondering why I'm gaining weight. There are parts of it I can control, but then there are parts, there are things in my life I cannot control. There are people in my life I can't control folks in my life, especially grown people. You know what I mean, folks, right now sitting around with an ulcer in their stomach over some other grown person that you don't have control over. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. Amen. Hear me out. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will always guide us into all truth. He'll show us things to come. 
Doesn't mean he's going to show up in your bedroom in a puff of smoke and say, this is the Lord. (laughs) Sometimes he'll have your pastor show up with a message that doesn't seem to be very spiritual. But it's warning you that if you don't get that stress under control, you're going to end up dealing with something else down the line that you'll be asking God to bring healing for that we wouldn't have needed healing for if we simply learned how to stop trying to control stuff that we don't have control over. I'm speaking to some mothers right now who have some grown children. It's time to put their grown behind on the altar and leave them there. Because the enemy's trying to use the love you have for your child, which is natural. It's a, a natural love. He's trying to use that love to put you in an early grave. See, there comes a place where we raise our kids to get to a certain age. We train them to make right decisions. Then we've got to get out of the way and let them make them. And sometimes they're going to make the wrong ones. But sometimes the only way they learn to make the right one is to make the wrong one enough time and deal with the consequences of the wrong decision enough time to where they realize, I need to stop making that decision and do what my mama told me to do a long time ago. But if mama keeps playing cushy pillow mama, where every time your kid makes a bad decision, they have to run their head into the wall, you keep putting a pillow there. That's my baby. That, that joke is 62 years old. You know, baby, that's a grown. <laughs> but if you keep playing pillow mama, keep stepping in to give money that you don't have to give. Keep playing pillow mama. You're up at 3 a.m. My mother told me, you go to jail if you want to. So I ain't coming to get you. <laughs> and she meant it, too. You keep playing cushy mama and letting your child make decisions, but they never have to feel the effect. I'm not saying leave them out there hanging to dry. I'm saying we got to learn how to stop letting ourselves get so worked up and stressed over decisions that we don't have control over. My kids that are in my house, minor children in my house, I do have control over them. You're going to do what I say do. I'm not, I'm not a new school daddy. I'm old school. Not a, t- not a tyrant, and we give our children a whole lot of space to grow up, but I'm not about to sit here and, 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 and negotiate with you. I'm paying all the bills. <laughs> Them clothes on your back belong to me. Come on, some, the food that you digest and I put. We're not about to negotiate, but when you get to an age where you got your own space, your own money, I'm not going to stay up all night worried about decisions you're making. I'm going to pray, release you to Jesus Christ, and I'm going to sleep really well. Because if I don't, you will be out there living your best life, and I'm here with ulcers in my stomach. Come on, help me out, somebody. Help me out, somebody. Somebody, you know I'm telling the truth right here. What I'm saying, we have to learn how to release it and allow it to be handled by God. We cannot afford to get over into carnality and try to handle everything on our own. That's what Martha was doing. See, when pressure comes, we have a choice. We can either tense up and start to brace ourselves for the worst, or we can take the position of rest and just trust Jesus and surrender to his way, to his will, and to his timing. Certain things we just can't control. We've got to learn how to release that thing over to God. John chapter 16, verse 33, I love this. It says this. Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. Everybody shout peace. He says, in the world, you will have tribulation. Everybody shout tribulation. Tribulation. Come on, shout again. Shout tribulation. Tribulation. He says, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. See, Jesus says, in in me, if you you stay in me, if you do things my way, if you do things the way I'm telling you to do, you're going to have peace. If you do things the world's way, if you go the world's direction, he says, you're going to have tribulation. Now, the word tribulation comes from a Greek word, thalipsis. It's spelled T-H-L-I-P-S-I-S, thalipsis. And it means a pressing, a pressing together, or a crushing pressure. And it literally refers to a heavy pressure situation. Jesus says, if you, as long as you're in the Word, you're going to have some pressure. I wish there was a prayer we could pray that makes all pressure go away. Amen. There's no prayer. There's no prayer. Even, watch this, even when you've done things God's way, there's still the potential for pressure. The word the lips is this word the lips is was first used to describe this specific act of torture and execution where they would tie a victim's hands together with a rope, 
lay him on his back, and then place a huge boulder on top of him until his body was crushed. See, the, 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 the goal or the intent was to take this person and their hands are tied so they don't have the ability to, 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 to push, push the boulder off of them. And they'd be lying on their back and they'd take this heavy boulder and press it on to their chest and let the boulder just rest on their chest until they have a hard time breathing. They're gasping for air. And then the boulder sits there long enough until it eventually crushes their rib cage and then collapses into their internal organs. And they sit here and watch this person die a slow death because they have this thalipsis, this boulder sitting on top of them, this heavy weight. And they can't do anything to get the weight off of them because their hands are tied. This is exactly what the enemy wants to do in our lives. See, he, he wants to take in our lives and make bills become a heavy weight. He wants the weight of that divorce to, to, to push on you. He wants you to go to, to your job that's supposed to be a blessing to help you grow and, and provide for your family. He wants that job to become a heavy weight. He wants money worries and stress and your kids and your families. And he wants it to crush you spiritually and emotionally until you barely feel, you feel like you're gasping for air in your everyday life. And some of you, I've just described where you are right now. And what the devil will tell you is you need to go to the doctor to get a pill. You don't need a pill. We need to learn how to deal with the stress. We need to learn how to recognize God didn't design us to live under this kind of a weight. Nobody can handle this kind of a weight all by yourself. You say, what am I supposed to do, Pastor? 1 Peter 5, 7, cast a hold of your care over on him. Begin to pray, Father, I leave this at the altar before you. Father, I cast this care over on you. I refuse to let myself, and your heavenly Father will lift the burden. And when he lifts the burden, he'll then help you up. And when he helps you up, he'll then help you go free so you can praise the name of Almighty God who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous lights. Come on, shout like you believe that's true. God is calling you to get set free. The Lord wants us to learn how to soar like the eagle instead of stressing like the hummingbird. There are two animals that I love. I've, stu I've studied them out. I love the eagle and I love the lion. The thing I love about the eagle, let me give you some facts about the eagle. When eagles are migrating, they rarely ever flap their wings. Yet they can reach speeds of 50 to 75 miles per hour. And eagles can make it up to heights as high as 10,000 feet in the air. Well, how do they do that? They're not flapping their wings. They do that through what's called thermal updrafts, which are these bursts of hot air that they catch hold of, almost like the tailwind we talked about last week. They get these bursts of hot air, and they learn how to watch it just ride the air. So instead of the eagle doing this, trying to go higher, the eagle just kind of hangs out here. Every now and then they flap, but they wait. They just wait, wait for the right opportunity. Come on, somebody. When that, when that burst of hot air comes, watch as they learn how to just go with the flow. Takes them up higher, and then they just go with the flow. And they just hang out here. They may hang out here for a long time, may hang out here for a little time. Then they get another burst of air, and they go up a little higher. The eagle has learned the art of just going with the flow. Tell your neighbor, go with the flow. Now, they, they didn't hear you. Tell them again. Tell them, go with the flow. Tell them on the other side, go with the flow. What am I saying? Yeah, we ought to push back against sickness. We ought to push back against disease. We ought to push back against poverty. But there's so many things we're fighting in life. That's not your fight. Some of you wearing yourself out on social media, arguing with people. There's a verse in the Bible that pertains to social media. Let the ignorant be ignorant still. Let me fight with you. You can say the sky is purple. Go ahead and enjoy that. The hummingbird, on the other hand, the hummingbird flaps his wings, watch this, 40 to 80 times per second. Did you hear me? 40 to 80 times per second. So from the time you say one, the hummingbird, has to... <laughs> and watch this, and even more than times than that, it flaps even faster than that during courtship or, or mating, which means for you, for you single hummingbirds out here, you come in flapping your normal 40 to 80 but you go through praise and worship, and you see some guy lift his hand, he'll have a ring on. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
about to pass out. <laughs> because the hummingbird is flapping so frantically, the hummingbird has to eat 50 to 60 times a day just to keep up with that metabolism. The hummingbird would starve overnight if it didn't have the ability to lower its body temperature. What are you trying to say, Pastor? There's a comparison. Are you the eagle or the hummingbird? Are you the eagle that has learned how to just go with the flow? What are y'all doing, man? Hey, bro. <laughs> you know, banjo back here, turn it off. <laughs> the, <laughs> I was born in California. <laughs> we can hear that. <laughs> Not invisible. What you doing? Are, are you the eagle? Christian has learned how to just go with the flow. Can't control all that. Are you the hummingbird that's sitting around every day? You got to fix everything. I got to get them right. Oh, I got to. If, if, if I don't show up, I don't know what anybody's going to do. You can be the hummingbird if you want to, but you can't get mad at God when you warn yourself out trying to fix stuff he never authorized you to fix. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my own peace. I now give and bequeath to you. Not like the world gives do I give it to you. Listen to this. Do not let your heart be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourself to be agitated and disturbed. And do not permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. See, Jesus spoke to his disciples and he told them, stop letting yourself get agitated. Stop letting that person at work bother you so much. Stop letting your sibling get the best of you. Stop letting that money situation get you so worked up. You do something about it. See, what this tells us is that we obviously have more control over our daily mood than we give ourselves credit for. We're not just a leaf in the wind that's got to be blown wherever the situation takes us. You wake up every day and make a decision. I'm having a good day today no matter what comes my way. See, every day I wake up and Jesus is still at the right hand of the throne. Every day I get up and the Father is still seated on the throne and he loves me. Every day I wake up and Holy Spirit is still living on the inside of me. Then no matter what comes on way, it still can be a good day today. And that's a decision I have to make. Hear me out. Surrendering to God means choosing faith over fear and rest over stress. Amen. And I can hear somebody say, yeah, but, but I know you're right, Pastor, but... You just don't know. I'm just trying. I'm trying so hard, Pastor. Hear me out. This is for you. And I'll end with this. Stop trying and start trusting. Stop trying. Stop trying. Start trusting. When you go into work tomorrow, just go in and walk in the door like this. They're going to call security on you. That's all right. Tell them, come on, bring it on. Bring it on. Just, just walk, in. You walk in there just like this. And they say something that mean that you don't like, just go. Wah-ha! I don't know what sound the ego makes. What sound they do? Hmm? Well, I'm done stressing. I'm going to start trusting. When your grown kid calls you with something dumb, hit the button for FaceTime. When they, when they, when they show up, they Like, mama, mama, what that mean? Just send them the, send them the video. Time to get to watch the video. <laughs> Time to stop stressing and start trusting. If you're determined to trust God instead of stressing, go ahead and give him a praise in this place today. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. This, this guy stood up right here, and it, the Lord reminded me of something he told me to say in the back. Most time when we think of a message like this, we think about all the ladies. Don't get me wrong, this does apply to you ladies. But I, I want to specifically say this to all of us men. Because men carry a weight sometimes we don't talk about. A lot of times you know a woman's weight because she'll tell you, she'll, she'll talk about it, she, she, she emotes. But men many times walk around with the weight of the world on our shoulders. 
That's why I love to say in our men's meetings when it's just us, nobody understands what it means to be a man but another man. Nobody understands what it means to try to figure out how we're going to pay for all this stuff and make sure the family's happy and take us on vacations and get everybody what they're believing for and asking for. Nobody understands that weight other than another man when you're a man. I'm not minimizing what women go through, but I'm saying to even to all of our men, you strong men, thank God. Come on, thank God for men that take care of their families. Come on, man, thank you. Thank you for being strong and not running away from responsibility, but even us strong men have to recognize before you can be a father, before you can be a husband, you got to be a son and be willing to climb up into your father's lap and let him give you the strength so the pressure's not on you. Put it back on him. Father, I need you to give me what I need to take care of your daughter. You know this girl. You don't want made her. <laughs> I need some help, God. I can't do this by myself. I'm calling on King Jesus for this. Don't put that stress on you. Put it back on your heavenly father. But I'll tell you this. I've been doing this for 30 plus years now. If you take good care of his daughter, he'll always make sure you have enough to take care of the need. Come on. And even put you in the overflow. Come on. Give God another shout of praise. Thanks, brother. Woo! All right, every head bowed, every eye closed in prayer. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to pray for you. I'm not here to embarrass you, man. This is not a church where we ask you to stand up and come up here to the front and put you on the spot. But there are a lot of you in here right now that if you're honest with yourself, you're a really good person. And that's, you've kind of convinced yourself that's enough. I'm a good person. I don't, I don't do too much wrong. But having a relationship with God, going to heaven, is not a matter of your good works outweighing your bad works one day. The Bible says you must be born again. What does it mean to be born again? It simply means that you have a day in your life where you realize, I need Jesus. And you make a decision to surrender control of your life over to him. Doesn't mean you're going to get everything right. Doesn't mean you're going to do it the right way every time. You may still make some mistakes, but he has control. And you're committed to surrendering life over to him. The Bible says if you'll allow him to be Lord of your life and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So if you're here today and you're not saved, you're not sure if you'd go to heaven or not, I want to ask you, ma'am or sir, teenager, will you let me pray for you today? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you up to the front. Right there at your seat or even right there at home online, I want to lead you in a simple prayer, but I need your permission to do so. So I'm going to count to three. When I get to three here in just a moment, if you say, yes, pastor, include me in on this prayer, then when I get to three, I want you to shoot your hand up as high as you can. I want you to be bold. I want you to be courageous. Don't be ashamed of God. I want you to raise your hand saying, yes, I'm ready to surrender my heart and my life to Jesus Christ today. There's some men in here that you've been trying to lead your family, but the best way to lead them is spiritually first. And I'm asking you to give me permission today to lead you in this simple prayer. So here we go. One, two, three. Come on, raise your hand if that's you. Thank you. Thank you. All over the room, hands are up. Keep it up for just a moment. Just just a moment. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I'm not going to ask you to do anything else other than raise your hand. Now you can put your hand down. I'm going to look around and see if there's anybody else we might have missed. Anybody that wanted to raise your hand and you didn't, go ahead and lift it around right now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. See that hand there. Anybody else? Wanted to lift my hand. I think I should have lifted my hand, but I didn't. Go ahead and raise it up now. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Another hand there in the back. Anybody else online or in the room, in the overflow room? All right. Every one of you that raised your hand, I want you to whisper this prayer right there at your seat. Say, dear God in heaven, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place. He paid the price for my sin, but you raised him from the dead. and He's alive right now. So Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me. Make me brand new. I surrender my life to you for the rest of my days. And according to the Bible, I am born again. Amen. Come on, put your hands together, Impact.